Hey, it's David, and you're listening to the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. Got some great new videos online at tonebass.co, including compositional lessons from the great Sergio Assad and a wonderful course on developing a perfect tremolo from Stephanie Jones. So if you're still not a member, go ahead and create an account online and use the promo code PODCAST-3 for 15 bucks off your subscription. That's PODCAST-3, all uppercase and all one word. Really pleased to have Matthew McAllister on the show today. We recorded this interview just the other day at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, which is where I'm studying for my master's degree right now and where Matthew teaches. I had a great conversation on his work with the BBC Three sponsored Big Guitar Weekend, which takes place at RCS, along with his organization at the Classical Guitar Retreat on the west coast of Scotland. Also talked about some of his chamber collaborations and his programming between CDs and concerts. Matthew's a beautiful and sensitive player, and I really enjoy his diverse repertoire and his balance between classical repertoire and also incorporating traditional Celtic music into his programs. So speaking of which, I'm going to play one of my favorite Celtic tunes. This is Matthew's recording of Spatter the Dew. So it is the eye of the storm for us. We're at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. We might get a little bit of field recording sounds from our instruments in the other rooms, but it is a week before the Big Guitar Weekend uh, that you helped put together. Tell me about this festival. 
Oh, that's great festival. So it's been going for quite a few years. Um, even before I was teaching, um, he and Alan had it up and running, I think, um, and used to play at it um, many moons ago, did some concerts at it. And then since I've been on staff, I've helped, um, you know, put it together with Alan. Alan used to run a big festival in Scotland called Dundee Guitar Festival over on the East Coast. Um, so he had, you know, brought so many great players to Scotland over the years. Um, and I'd been a benefactor of that you know as a young student get master classes watch great artists play in yeah. Scotland and then he sort of brought that really in a sense um, after a few years of that not happening he kind of I think started Big Guitar Weekend not long after and it's just like a you know sort of Friday through Sunday um, immersion in classical guitar you know we have uh, a guitarist plays the sort of like the kind of prestigious Friday at one concert here at the conservatoire that can be you know, a string quartet one week piano whatever um, but guitar gets that slot and then right after that we have master class so we've got Goran Solskjaer coming in um, to do that which will be fab and then we've got Paul Galbraith who's one of our uh, associate artists here of the conservatoire's guitar department he's coming to do a concert, Meng Su's coming over, um, so part of the Beijing Guitar Duo. She's coming over to do a solo show from Hong Kong. And then um, Alan, Alan Neves, the head of guitar here, my old teacher, is doing a sort of concert with String Quartet and friends. I'll join them from some, for some duos and stuff. Um, so we're sort of like a week and a half out, and it's, it's madness. It's like lesson scheduling. It's making sure everybody's going to have nice time with good teachers, uh, making sure all the concerts are going to work. And we've got a kind of cool... Uh, artistic planning department here at RCS which help us out with all that sort of stuff so it's one of the busiest times of year and it's also the start of term so it's yeah it's kind perfect of perfect time yeah, yeah I know it's like yeah, you've got new students arriving everybody's getting set up and we're like let's have a guitar festival <laughs> that'll be great um, but it's good fun really good fun yeah yeah, yeah. Where, where do you play with Alan then or can um, you not say uh, yeah it's top secret top yeah, secret you have to come to the concert um, well he's doing a concert of like Alan even friends and I'm sure he's got like some Boccherini with a string quartet I think he's got some Brower with quartet as well. We're going to play maybe some early music, um, some Baroque stuff to begin the concert. The uh, Big Guitar Weekend this year is being covered by BBC Radio 3. So okay. a lot of the concerts, yeah, a lot of the concerts have been recorded for future broadcast on the radio. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll play some early music to get the to get the sort of concert going. So. Are any of the shows going to be uh, broadcasted live or are they going to be more for archival? I footage? think they'll be, um, I think they're just getting recorded and then um, put into different shows on, on the radio okay. know, at different points in time, you know, probably quite quite soon after yeah, record, yeah. really, you know. Uh, we do broadcast quite a lot of live concerts from, from here, from RCS. Tends to be if there's a series of something. Yeah, you yeah. know, say we have like quite a lot of song cycles and we have a lot of concerts where maybe a string quartet come and play, you know, a whole Beethoven cycle or a whole Shostakovich cycle or whatever. So, and sometimes they, those are broadcast live and other times the BBC come in and do a lot of archival recording here. We've got a great, great hall, Stevenson Hall. So um, it sounds really good. So, yeah, 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 it's beautiful. Acoustics yeah. for guitar. Exactly, yeah. yeah well, I'm really excited uh, because I, I've interviewed a couple of different people about these festivals. They're putting together and everything. And I'm not able to go to most of them because I tend to be in that town just for that weekend to shoot yeah. these interviews so uh, or record these interviews. So it's uh, it's really nice to be there yeah. uh, well, for a change. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, you're front and center on the Friday night because... Um, I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot now. It's like I'm interviewing you, but you're um, <laughs> you're actually playing on the Friday night in the the sort of RCS uh, student showcase. We've got a lot of um, that's a that's a really nice concert. That's you know we have like the, the the Friday at one concert, which is you know often a sort of figurehead of the guitar, um, something like Goran Solskjaer, you know, and then he does a masterclass, and then in the evening, um, well, you know, we've got quite a lot of uh, quite a big program in the evening of, of students playing some really excellent repertoire, and you're you're rocking out some uh, Libra Sonatine by Dietz, I think that. We'll night. see how it goes. It'll be excellent. <laughs> It'll be excellent. So yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's going to be quite the weekend. And how long has this festival been going on at RCS? Is it fairly no. new, or has it been no for a while? I think this must be, I mean, Alan will correct me, I'm sure, at some point if I get this wrong, but I think this could be like nine, eight or nine. We're coming up towards oh, ten okay. years. I mean, yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, he ran Dundee for about 17 years, um, and then I run another festival in Scotland, um, Classical Guitar Retreat, which has been going for, well, it'll be its 12th year next year. Yeah, wow. And then it's been, there's a lot happens for guitar in Scotland. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a there's lot. There's a great events. scene. There is, yeah, and a lot of great students um, and a buzz, you know, a real buzz about it, you know, a lot of opportunities. And I, I've heard uh, the location, your festival, Classical Guitar Retreat, is just gorgeous. Where is it exactly? Yeah, it's, um, it's the opposite of your, like, inner city guitar festival. It's... Um, 
off the west coast, so you would sort of take a train about an hour away from Glasgow, sort of directly west. And for my LA friends, this is uh, UK West Coast. It's a yeah, bit different. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is not your sort of like Pacific Coast Highway sort of vibe. You know, it's not Malibu or North Hollywood. <laughs> it's uh, freezing cold. No, I mean, it, actually, in the summer when the festival runs, it's usually pretty nice weather. But um, right now we're sort of you know late October. It's yeah, not, it's, it would be a day trip out there. But it's called the island is called the island of Cumbrae. Um, and it's a very close to the mainland. The ferry journey is about 10, 15 minutes maximum. So you just take a train out about an hour away from Glasgow, right to the west coast, and then a little ferry ride over, um, and then you're on this little island. It's got a cathedral, which was um, still a cathedral, and it was like a cathedral really for the islands there. People would, you know, all congregate there, take, you know, service or mass. It's an Episcopalian cathedral. Um, and then... Uh, it also had a lot of rooms, sort of like, essentially for ecumenical training. So a lot of people would go there and train. Um, and now those rooms are more used for bed and breakfast, you mm-hmm. know? So there's kind of like a hospitality centre there, old library, old common rooms, and we can we can have lessons, we can have lectures, concerts in the cathedral. Um, and it's become a real fixture of like the summertime in that yeah, little island yeah. you know it's like they call it guitar island for that week. guitar yeah, island yeah. oh great yeah yeah so it's like a week and it's just uh yeah it's great students come from all over um there's a lot of student opportunities to perform and play as well but we've had like you know david russell um with like anna vidovich we've had martin dilla we've had gabriel bianco a couple of times we've had the kopinski duo you know, Roland Dienz came, you know, there was, I mean, we've had incredible yeah, uh, yeah. artists over the years, you know, come to perform. And I've heard the acoustics in the cathedral are phenomenal for the guitar. Yeah, they are. It's not big. So, you know, cathedral sounds really grand, uh, but it, it was obviously for the islands. So it's, yeah. it's a very small venue. I mean, it holds about, I think, 110 maximum. So that's, oh, really? that's me huh. stacking it full. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So all the concerts are full, obviously, because, you know, we, it's, there's, there's enough of a buzz about guitar to, to fill that every time. I record a lot there, you know, over the years I've recorded, you know, many albums there because the acoustics are so good. And I think that's maybe why um, I was attracted to it as a festival. I wouldn't wouldn't need to amplify. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't really need to do much to create the proper kind of listening experience for classical guitar because, you know, yourself, some venues we get put in are huge and Mm -hmm. we can't like, you know, we can't cope. We have to get mic'd up. We have to get amplified up and becomes a bit of an unnatural experience for the player, sometimes for the listener too. So I wanted something that was more like um, really a really honest representation of the instrument and a beautiful acoustic. So yeah, that yeah. there the, the, the great acoustics for guitar. Well, speaking of your recordings, one of the things I really enjoy about uh, your CDs and records is they, each one seems to have a very clear uh, programmatic approach yeah. from mm-hmm. your French album to your Celtic. Yeah. How'd you go about programming those? Um, that that's come about, I think, because I got annoyed with classical guitar CDs. Do you know uh-huh. what I mean? I just got guitar recital. Yeah, just and like another Naxos release of like seventeen unconnected tunes that make absolutely no sense sitting next to each other in a listening experience. But it's just the repertoire that that player's got under their fingers. You yeah, know, at, yeah. at that moment in time. Um, and you know, people see these things as a step up and like and as a good thing. And you know, Naxos was responsible for us listening to a lot of good young players that we'd never heard before, getting a lot of recordings uh, down of repertoire. Um, But it's not the most artistically pleasing um, statement in the world, you know, or or Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily something that you would ruminate on for a long time as an idea and really, really think about and really give... um, It's not even very scholarly either, you know. it's It's not really interesting for the sake of, like, a specific area of the guitar world, you know, so... Um, and I got frustrated and then people that maybe weren't on Naxos would copy that model. So the guitar world's full of like, you know, these CDs where you're just like Baba next to a Bach suite, next to, you know, some music by Albanith, which is a transcription, next to, you know, the Nocturnal, next to, you know, some Ponce preludes. And you're like, none of this makes sense. It's like having, yeah. it's like having your, your baked beans, you know, and then a steak and then some nice ice cream with a sorbet, with some French fries. Well, you, for, you forgot the ketchup. For yeah, the exactly, and the mayo. And the, I mean, everything's stuffed in there in yeah. one, like, you know, huge meal. So I never really enjoyed it. And you would just listen to a track or whatever. So I kind of, I guess I was slightly, slightly going against that, you yeah, know, yeah. and trying to think, well, actually, when I listen to things, 
I really liked albums like, you know, um, Melody at Night with You, Keith Jarrett albums, like solo piano, all mm-hmm. folk kind of inspired music, all, you know, with improvisation put together. Um, I liked a lot of like, you know, the, almost like the solo jazz musicians, like maybe Bill Evans, um, Brad Melder. Sometimes they would do albums that would be in one style or in one sound world, you know. Um also like rock bands that do like essentially a kind of concept album like yeah. you know they decide I'm going to go in and I'm going to we're going to work on this so you know I think the French album made sense to me because there's so much great French music um, for guitar Celtic album obviously makes a lot of sense the, maybe the boldest one was the American one which you know we had like Philip Glass quartets we had like Frank Zappa Chick Corea you know all this kind it's of quite different a range, stuff yeah. yeah Lou Harrison um, you know, really, really, you know, Ralph Town, another one of my like, you know, heroes of, of kind of like guitar playing and composition. It's like, you know, so the albums in a sense have got some really strong classical sort of element, and then others. I mean, I've done other albums, like I did an album of like juxtaposition of Bach's music with Brower's music, using the the second suite by Brower and the first suite of cello by Bach and different transcriptions and things. So again, trying to give something some sort of idea, you know, yeah. and some sort of theme. And I guess, yeah, I guess it's a resistance of the norm in classical guitar and it's someone to do something that's different. Um, but it also, I'm not just interested only in classical repertoire, so it's a really good way of not sort of pigeoning hole this as a classical release that can't have a bit of Zappa on it or a bit of Towner or a bit of whatever, or even in the Celtic music can't have, you know, maybe like... Um, a really transcription of something that's really quite folk, really, really folk orientated. You know, it's not classical at all, but then it could also have like the Toru Takamitsu transcription of, of Danny Boy on it. And that's not a problem either, you know. So it allows you a lot of freedom, even though you think you're giving yourself a theme. Mm-hmm. It doesn't shut it down. It opens it up for you, you know. Um, and right now I'm trying to get my head around an Italian sort of, I don't know if it'll be a collection of Italian music or if it'll be maybe early Italian music. I'm sort of working on a lot of Scarlatti at okay, the minute. Okay, cool. Um, and just, just going through all the possible transcriptions that there are that exist already. I mean, you know, Brower, Barueco, David Russell, there's so many great um, transcriptions already um, out there. So I'm just sort of, in a sense, whittling down to the sonatas I think work the best on the guitar. You know, I don't know what that'll become, but I'm, I'm looking at that. Just yeah, now, yeah. So, yeah. Just uh, scoping out yeah, the yeah. repertoire. Well, it, it's, it's sad and... This era now with Spotify, Tidal, yeah. whatever people yeah. are listening to. I, I like Tidal. Yeah, um, it's good. Mm. Yeah, but it, in a way, it's amazing that people have so much access to any music they want. But it definitely has forced the loss. Maybe not forced, but it's caused a bit of yeah. a loss in the art of creating a, a record with yeah. a whether it be a concept album or a record with a whole theme, because so many people are just listening to one track off of this. And Absolutely. For people like, there's yeah. still many people like myself who love to listen to a record yeah. all the way through, but I think that might be part of what's happening. So, Yeah, well, I think, I think maybe, I think two things happen with this. One, if the only way you can get your music is the way a record company allowed you to take it, meant that if you didn't like listening to concept albums, you were screwed in the 80s and in the mm-hmm. 90s, do you know I mean? Because that's what you got, right? You know, um, now I think it's much more democratic. Like, you know, you can listen to a playlist of something, a particular track can come on, it can, you know, sort of get your interest going and then you follow that artist and then their albums are there and then their music's there and then there's the biography. And I mean, now people are just re- releasing singles. They're going, I'm just going to release that as a single, you know, maybe with a video, you know, because that can accompany it on Apple Music or, you know, there are like a lot of... I agree, like, maybe the idea of sitting down and listening to a concept album is gone, but then the people that will want to do that are the people who you really want listening to your music because they care about the fact that you made it like that. You yeah. know? So I kind of don't mind if someone's searching for a specific piece now and they can find my performance of that. Mm-hmm. And I don't mind if someone is following me and wants to hear what the next theme is that I'm going to tackle. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, you know, and I think it maybe makes a it makes a clear categorization of your audience of the like follower and the person who appreciates artistically what you're doing. And then the casual listener who followed you on a whim because they liked the particular piece and happened in a playlist or something to find your, your, your performance. So I, I agree with you. I think like often we fear change a bit. So we all kind of like, we're like, Oh no, the music world's changing. People aren't going to listen to my music the way I want them to. And it's like, well, now they have a lot of, a lot of possibilities to, to yeah. find your music, you know? Um, yeah, we're all making less money. There's no doubt about that. But there, you know, you have to kind of move on. You do. You do have to think. Okay, 
how can I how can I best uh, present my stuff for the new market that there is, you know? Um, and it's it's still constantly evolving. I don't think it's I don't think it's decided what it is yet. If you know what I mean? You know? Oh yeah, absolutely. No, yeah. it's uh, it's good to appeal. Yeah, to everybody. Totally. In a sense. Um, I mean, why do you like Tidal more than Spotify? Just out of interest. Oh well, uh, Tidal. It was actually produced by Jay Z. Yeah, yeah, not produced. Yeah, so it was yeah. created by Jay Z. But basically, Tidal uses uh, lossless audio, so ah, there's no compression yeah. that takes away from the uh, quality. Yeah. So then, that, like as an audio file, you're like, okay. Yeah. Most of it's at great. 41 kilohertz and 16 yeah. bit audio, which is CD quality. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Whereas just massive. Honestly, you can't tell a difference unless if you're seriously listening either on very nice headphones yeah. with a good amp, good yeah. converters, or studio monitors, but. Yeah. When yeah, you but you in. would be, you know, so that's the thing. So for you, you're almost choosing the, the, the streaming service that actually provides you the quality of audio. That's what you've prioritised. Whereas, you know, I think the casual listener going to work or commuting or something on the train or the bus is like, I just want my playlist of happy music today. Yeah. You know, been on Spotify. And it's like, what? Yeah. I, no, it's, I, I don't it's care. not bad on Spotify. Yeah, yeah. No. The one yeah. that's really bad, though, is Pandora. That's what you want to... But they like make it bad one. on purpose because I think you can actually download specific songs from Pandora so they make the audio quality they they use ah. a, a data rate of I think it's 128 Oof, kilobytes right, okay. per second which yeah. is not good usually no. usually uh, quote unquote I feel goofy saying good mp3 yeah, mp3s yeah. are not good but a good mp3 is yeah. at 320 yeah, yeah. Yeah. but they do that so then you're still likely to either buy the CD or try to listen to it other ways. It's exactly. funny. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, no one listens to Pandora anymore. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. I, I was kind of shocked when I read that, but I thought, I don't know anyone who no, still no, uses no, this definitely platform. Not. Definitely not. But I, I, I will say I still use Spotify a lot of the time, especially yeah. if I'm on the go, because yeah. Spotify has got their library and sorting down yeah, pretty well. Title is a nightmare to find. and. And the problem is there's a lot of classical music that's not on Tidal. Yeah. Actually, I think because it's a newer platform. Yeah, and probably. depending on how people are distributing Yeah, their well, music I still listen online. to vinyl. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've yeah. still got a vinyl collection and a huge CD collection, and I don't I don't mind. Um, I, I really like putting records on like that. You there's know? something beautiful about yeah. having a physical copy. And it's also still a lot of LPs that have never been digitized. So there's a lot, I've got a lot yeah. of old guitar records of great players, you know, and you just can't find their stuff digitally at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's always good to listen different ways. Absolutely. So you, you play a lot of chamber music. I've you know had duos over the years with other instrumentalists as well. You know, voice, uh, violin. I had a, a, a duo for a long time with a, a violinist who was like a classical player, and also a traditional fiddler. So we that was a good way to get into Celtic music, Irish yeah, music, yeah. Scottish music. And then more recently, I have a trio with harp and voice, so tenor voice, hmm. and then like concert harp, classical harp, and that's all folk music kind of reimagined. It's like, um, you know, it can be we can do the music of like Robert Burns and the poetry of Robert Burns, all reimagined, and it's all written by uh, different composers. Um, so it's really like folk music in a kind of classical setting, but really reimagining the harmony, the way things are sort of presented. And that also has like the poetry of Dylan Thomas. So it's like Welsh music, Irish music, Scottish music, okay. uh, island music, like from the North, Arcadian music. Um, and the the trio is called the Bardic Trio. And it's all about this kind of like the idea of the bard or the poetic and kind of like music and uh, a lot of storytelling, you know. Um, so it's totally different from classical guitar. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Yeah, you're, 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 even the way the guitar fits in with that trio is really quite different to how the guitar would normally fit in, um, let's say, if it was a guitar trio, you know. Uh, you know, your role can be like really counter melody. Your role can be, you know, you're with a harp. So a harp can in, in a way do a lot of things that are quite similar to the guitar. So the guitar takes on quite an expressive role. It's like a kind of almost like a viola or something in a in a trio. It's really really interesting. Um, yeah. You know. How do you guys go about hashing out those arrangements? Is it a collaborative effort or? Um, well, no. We commission composers to do it. You know. Oh, so, I see. Yeah. Okay. So we work. Um, we there's a few composers that actually Eddie Maguire, one of them, has written a lot for guitar. Um, who's a, a Scottish composer living in Glasgow. Alistair Nicholson, who I think lives down in London Way, and he um, runs the St Magnus Festival up in Orkney. He's he's set a lot of things for us. Um, so we're actually we're actually collaborating with classical contemporary composers yeah. who have a let's say they have a 
a skill at reimagining music from old manuscripts or old folk music and setting it for this new sort of idea. And I mean, it's kind of interesting because I think if you're a composer now, writing another string quartet is fine, but you do have a massive canon of string quartets to go up against, yeah. you know. Um, writing for a, a, say, like that kind of instrumentation, voice, harp and guitar, gives you a huge amount of possibilities that haven't been that explored, you know. We've done a lot of Mexican folk music because that, the harp is a very popular instrument in Mexico. Right, guitar no also, yeah, yeah, no, I didn't know either. And went on a tour of Mexico with, with harp and voice, you know, and played all over. It was fantastic. That was a good few years ago. So how do you uh, travel with a harp? Or do uh, you just rent? They just rent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, just, no, imagine that at check-in. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, you know, can I fit I, this on the overhead? Like, you know, like. Guitar is difficult enough. I know. No, there'd be no chance. You'd want to stand in a different queue to the harpist as we're walking up to the friendly gate agent, you know? but um, Going through customs and everything. Yeah, no, you just rent. And I mean, then even, even in Mexico, I remember a guy had to drive the harp almost from, like, one end of Mexico to the other for a gig. You know, he had to leave three or four days before wow. the next concert because he was driving it in a van, you know? Yeah. Um, so, no, it's no joke travelling with a harp, you know. It's, uh, it's quite scary. <laughs> I don't even know how lutenists travel. Yeah, well, like the Orbo players it's and kinda, things like that, yeah. I mean, it's, harp is still a bit of a specialised instrument, but I feel like it would be easier to find a harp rental as opposed to a theorobo or a yeah, harsh loop. Maybe I'm wrong, so. though. Uh, maybe the loop players have their own, like, kind of crowd, you know, like... Get their know, connections. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, like that kind of couch surfing kind of, like, syndicate. But probably they're all like, okay, if you're in if you're in Leipzig and you need a loop, you can call these people. I mean, we, we played in Germany one time, uh, right down in the south, so really Bavaria, and we got a harp from a conservatory in Austria and drove it over the border. Hmm. So the, the harp player had connections with the harp teacher, I think, in, I can't remember if it was Graz or Linz or something like that. And we ended up getting the harp of their, their conservatory and, and bringing it over for the rehearsals and for the concerts. So yeah. I think if you play like an endangered species of instrument, then I think the people that all play it, it's a, it's a, it's a network. It's part you know of, I mean? <laughs> it's just part of what you do. Yeah, and, and, and I think you probably, you can reach out and get help from friends and stuff like that. Yeah. So you're putting me on the spot earlier. Now I'm going to put you on the spot. You've been teaching here at yeah. RCS, the Royal Conservatory of Scotland. Well, first of all, I've got to clear this up. This yeah. is for me. Yeah. Why is, it, there was a name change, right? There was a name change, yeah. I mean, I studied here. Uh, like what feels like hundreds of years ago, and it was called the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. So what, what changed it from an academy to a conservatoire? Um, yeah, I mean, the people that are probably best to ask are the taxi drivers of Glasgow, <laughs> who for a while had such a problem with this name conservatoire, because A, it was French, and B, a conservatory in Scotland is something you stick on the end of your house, and it's made of glass, and it will get a bit of sun, not that we have much Oh, that's sun. what they call it? Yeah, yeah, huh. conservatory. So the taxi driver had a field day with this idea of the Royal <laughs> Conservatoire of Scotland, you know. And also, I think if you if you just use one word randomly from a different language, you know, if you just put, like, a French word... In Sounds the official. Of Sounds official or pretentious. I can't really decide which one it does. I, I, I think it's a bit of both, <laughs> yeah. though, in this case. But anyway, yeah. you, you've been teaching here for yeah, quite a while. How long has it been? Well, yeah, I used to... I mean, obviously, I studied here when it was academy, um, and then we had a name change, and then I started teaching at the junior conservatoire for a while, and then... Um, got roped in. Alan pulled me in to um, teaching at uh, the seniors. So it's been—I don't even know—it's been uh, quite a long time, maybe, maybe ten years or so now. Um, in, in one way or another, at least, you know. And we changed the name. Uh, sort of going back to your original thing, we changed the name because we were, you know, we had a dance course, we have a jazz course, we have traditional music, we have musical theatre, um, we have courses for. Uh, deaf actors you know it's like it's incredible oh, yeah wow. like absolutely incredible like the, the courses they have British Sign Language I mean so much going on um, here at, at the Conservatoire so I think rather than keeping adding things Royal Scottish Academy of Music Dance Drama Jazz Trad you know whatever all these things Conservatoire was one umbrella term that sort of you know keeps all the arts under the one yeah, bracket yeah yeah so we became RCS which um I think there was a bit of reticence at the start, but now I think people love it. You know, it's like, it's just where all the art happens. It's like Scotland's National Conservatoire of the Arts, and I think people get it now. It's quite a big guitar department out yep. here. I, yep. I mean, how many guitar majors do we have now? About 30? Uh, no, just under, but I mean, not far off, at least 24, yeah. 24 25, uh, which would include doctoral students. I mean, we have, you know, um, we have bachelors, we have masters, 
uh, which can be a two-year course or a one-year course. And then we have doctoral students. Um, we've only got one doctoral candidate at the minute, which is uh, Sasha Savaloni, he's an excellent player. Um, and then, you know, like yourself, you're on master's, it's a great class of master's students. And then some of the undergraduates as well. I mean, it's like, it's such an international school for guitar. I mean, you're talking, you know, America, Canada, Venezuela, France, Italy, you know, uh, Malaysia, Korea, Poland. I mean, the, the people that are studying here are from all over the world. Yeah. Um, and very, very gifted uh, students. And much of that has been to do with um, the alumni from here and the teachers from here playing so far afield and having um, careers that are very visible and careers that I don't think are just the norm, like the standard guitar career. I think what's happened is students have said, oh, I want to develop that kind of way. And I can see an alumni comes from that school and has that type of career. Hmm, there must be something going on. Do you yeah, know? And slowly yeah. but surely people gravitate towards this idea that I think we produce very different students, not a class of student all made in the one image of one teacher or in the one style of playing. But um, the, the, what the student brings to the table is as valid as what the teacher is going to impart at that table. And then the dialogue between the two, are, are it's very organic and you're trying to essentially create the best version of themselves for, for the student or at least enable them to have the opportunities to do that. So, um, you know, it's a big department um, and uh, it's, also, it's a lot of responsibility looking after all of you lot. I know how important... Some advice was for me when I was kind of the age of you or the age of younger, you know, um, and you want to impart the right things, say the right things at the right time, sort of push the buttons at the right time so people kind of respond and yeah. and, and raise themselves up for a challenge. But uh, it's a great thing. And, you know, we were saying at the beginning of this, I think about Big Guitar Weekend and having a festival right at the start of the year. And it's a bit crazy timing. It's also amazing because you, you turn up in Glasgow and suddenly you're like, wow. There's so much going on for guitar. Gets you inspired, for sure. Absolutely. You want to see the amount of work people can do sometimes before Christmas, from like, you know, the start of a term in October to Christmas. It's incredible. Maybe more life, uh, or more work, sorry, in that part of their life than they've, they've done in a lot of years of practice on the guitar. A lot of inspiration, anyway. You yeah. Know? Um, but teaching's good. I mean, the only problem with teaching is you don't find much time to practice. Yeah, <laughs> it's always trying to find the balance. Yeah, I guess because you're always you're always showing other people how to do something, and you're thinking, oh, I forgot how to do this. How myself? do I do that myself? Yeah. Like, you know? <laughs> um, so that's quite fun. But uh, no, I love teaching. So you've got quite a few international concerts coming up. Is that right? Well, it's busy. It's always busy. Um, and that's the thing: balancing all your sort of touring with like your teaching and things. But um, this year, I've not got a huge amount left in terms of performance. I've got a lot of teaching in a lot of classes. I'm in China, uh, France, oh, and then the Highlands of Scotland doing some bits and pieces. Um, so that's kind of like close to home and then as far away as you can almost get with like China and, and, and well, uh, France isn't so far, but China, certainly it's the other side of the world for us. But um, And then next year's really busy. Like next year I'll be at Nürtingen at the Guitar Festival there, which is a great, a great sort of celebration of guitar in Germany for, you know, over a week. Um, so I'll be playing a concert at that. Are we playing in Iceland next year, which I'm Iceland. excited about. Yeah, I've played Have you in, been out there before? Yeah, I've played there before in a festival that was called the Land of the Midnight Sun Guitar Festival, which Ooh. is cool. It was a really small festival, and it was like the concerts were later in the evening, and it was really nice. But next year, I think I go out about Easter time just to do just do a concert and I think some teaching. Um, yeah, and then I'm in I'm in Germany. Uh, I'm in China again next year. Guitar seems to be popular in China. We're all it's a big scene. Yeah, we're all getting we're all getting those plane tickets to China. It's interesting. I don't know. Um, I love I love going anywhere to play the guitar, and I've been to China quite a lot. Uh, and it is incredible the scene. Like you know, you're you're sort of stunned sometimes when you go over there and you realise there's you know a thousand to two thousand people watching a concert of guitar music, you know, and yeah. you sort of think in some places in the West, it's hard for them to get an audience of 200, you yeah. know. So, um, yeah, it's quite an explosion over there. Um, when you go out to China, do you find your programming a bit differently from well, to other Western countries or do you try to bring um, some yeah. of that repertoire out there? It's an interesting question because it, it, it's been tricky. It's been interesting. Like sometimes more so than over here in, like, say, Scotland or in Europe. Um, there's you can quite often do what you kind of want. What you're playing, what the repertoire you're working on, just becomes your season program or whatever. But in China, the agents have a lot more push and a lot more control over what you're playing. They're quite 
they're asking you for certain pieces okay. or they're looking at your program and saying more of that kind of thing, less of this kind of thing. So they know their audience well and obviously they're getting feedback from their audience and they know what they know what goes well. Or at least I hope that's the, the idea behind why they're mm-hmm. so insistent on certain things. Um, I've gone off the beaten track before in China and played different pieces to what um, was agreed and things like that. And it kind of, you know, it can go down absolutely fine with the audience, but the agents will, will, will pull you up on it later. You yeah. know, so... There's definitely a difference over there. Um, in I mean, in, also Western classical music hasn't been going into China really for that long. If you think about it, you know, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think it was one of the American orchestras that got over first to play some from, from you know, to, to play in China. So I, I think it, it's still something that's um, they're figuring out how best to present it to their public, and they're figuring out um, what works and what doesn't work. You yeah. Know? Um, but it's really interesting. You get you know what guitars like. It's an intimate instrument. It doesn't play in huge, huge venues. So you tend to speak to your audience and you tend to talk to them afterwards. So it's a good instrument for getting in there and, and exposing people to different types of repertoire and, you know, different types of players and things. So its popularity makes sense to me in China. And you think of instruments like the pipa and all, you know, the traditional Chinese classical instruments. They, there's, you know, you can play... I'll, you can play their music as well. You can play music that is essentially like, you know, I mean, I'm not necessarily their music, but like things like Sakura Variations or some of the pieces yeah. that Zhufi Yang has, has, has commissioned over the years. There's repertoire out there that you can put into your programs that goes down really well with, with the Chinese audience, you know, and then you can juxtapose that with maybe more standard repertoire or maybe something a bit more out there that yeah, you want to yeah. bring. You know, do they like do Celtic that. repertoire? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, whiskey in China is massively imported. You know, they love whiskey. So oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I knew absolutely. Japan was really big as Japan, well. Oh, Japan are great at making whiskey as well. Yeah, they, like, they're you know, pretty good. Some of the whiskeys um, win huge awards, some of the Japanese whiskeys. Um, but the Chinese, yeah, I've been over quite a few times um, and actually, you know, like after concerts or whatever, the promoters have taken me to like a specific whiskey bar and mm-hmm. you know they're, they're nuts for it they love it so okay maybe that's just like the alcohol and the taste of it but that also comes with the, the culture and it comes with all that kind of stuff so yeah they're, they're, whenever I've played any Celtic stuff it's gone down really well um, and even students as well have come to classes and you know have expressed that they've read through some pieces or looked at some stuff and we've worked on some things yeah. so no it's not alien to them at all you know and then what's the language barrier like for you it's tricky you, you don't speak uh, no Mandarin no or no kid. not yeah. at all ni hao and that's about it you know you say hello and then do a, you know a very basic introduction of a piece and then uh, panic massively uh, about not being able to speak the language it's kind of the laziness of being an english speaker you know um we were not tested enough um i probably will be in france soon because they quite like you to speak french if you're over there which is great i really appreciate being forced to try um not so bad. I mean, most of the time at classes, there'll be an interpreter there or the students will have such good English that you don't even need one, you know. Mm. Um, for example, if you're coming to study here, and we have had students in the past from China, we've students from Malaysia and Korea and different, different countries, certainly Asian countries at the moment. Obviously, they have to pass examinations so that they can kind of prove that they're going to be able to take as much from all these classes as they possibly can, you know. I mean, you don't want lessons to be so mechanical that you're just showing all the time what to do or that you're not talking about um, art and and things that are difficult subjects, expressive subjects, things that need big vocabulary, things that need you to use simile, metaphor, different ways of trying to explain things to people and get them to, to, to interpret something from a different angle. So what you don't want to find is that you have a le- level of English that's quite good, but it's quite basic. You know what I mean, and it can't it can't talk about nuance or subtlety or 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 grandiose kind of things. You know, so um, it's difficult. It's definitely difficult. I've found teaching in 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 China quite quite challenging. But in the same way as I found I found teaching in other other countries that which have a Latin based language. You know, like even for example, sometimes teaching in um, South America is really really challenging. Yeah. You know, because um, sometimes you think like your grasp of of, of Spanish is enough to convey something and then actually you're it's all very basic what you're saying do you know what i mean you know so you're again trying to get through something a bit more sophisticated is kind of hard but um usually in china they're aware of that barrier and they help you with a with an interpreter yeah 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 because i've always wondered because i've heard about a lot of guitarists heading over there who don't speak don't speak at all yeah yeah, um 
Well, they speak English, but yeah, <laughs> they're yeah. not mute. <laughs> <Yeah>. But <laughs> well, some well, of them some. should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we won't give names, or if we do, I'll have to beep them out. I think I've been relatively well behaved. No, so you, far. you've been very well I mean, behaved. Me, so thank you. I, yeah, I know. For me, I think you've got me at the right time of day, and I'm in the conservatoire. So yeah, you not, gotta you gotta watch your mouth. Here, yeah, though. if we had done this in a bar, then you know, like everyone and a was a couple game. pints right before. <laughs> yeah, then that would be it. <laughs> be excommunicated from the classical guitar church instantly <laughs> like you know um no um you're right it's it's funny it's it, a lot of people do yeah they, they maybe don't necessarily think about that sort of thing when they go to teach um i've always had an interpreter every time i think i've taught and i've worked with people that have invited me to china who really care about the lessons they're not just an adjunct to the concerts or yeah. the tour so they they want they wanted to be set up the best that can be for yeah, the student yeah yeah they want the best for the audience yeah absolutely Thank you, Matt, for being on the show. Please join me in two weeks for the long-awaited second part of Ben Verdery. I'm going to leave things today with a really wonderful composition that I've never heard on the guitar. This is Philip Glass's third string quartet titled Mishima. I thought I'd read just a little excerpt on what Philip Glass says about this piece. The film Mishima follows a complex narrative structure which divides the life of this famous contemporary Japanese novelist into three parts, his childhood, his mature years, and the last day of his life. These subjects were intercut to produce a shifting kaleidoscope vision of Mishima's life. The scenes of his childhood were filmed in black and white and scored for string quartet. At the time of writing the film music, I anticipated the string quartet section to be extracted from the film score and to be made into a concert piece of its own. That's the background behind this piece. And as you'll hear, it's a fantastic arrangement. Really beautiful to listen to. This is featuring Matthew McAllister, Alan Neve, Earl Sparrick, and Sasha Savaloni. I'm David Steinhardt, and we'll see you next time for the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. <laughs>